I'm Arian Mack. I'm editor of social research and Marrow professor of psychology here at the New School. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this, the opening of our 28th social research conference. This one, as you know, is called Giving, Caring for the Needs of Strangers. Social research has been the journal of the New School for Social Research since 1934, when it was uh, launched by the first president of the New School, Alvin Johnson, with the small group of exiled scholars whom he managed to bring out of Germany just at the moment when primarily Jewish, but uh, others as well, were being threatened by the Nazi onslaught. Uh, they, this group of exiles, along with uh, Alvin Johnson, created what was called the University in Exile, not now called the New School for Social Research at the New School, and uh, that group launched social research, and it's been uh, the Journal of the New School ever since. Our conference series, like the journal, was and is intended to be the public or a public voice of the New School. We held our first conference in time of plague in 1988. It looked at the AIDS epidemic in light of the long history of social uh, and social consequences of lethal epidemic diseases. Our three most recent conferences, all of which occurred in the last academic year, were Human Rights in the Global Economy, The Future of Higher Education, and Egypt in Transition. And we are holding a conference in the spring on food and migrant life. All the papers delivered at our conferences, including those which you will uh, be given over the next days at this conference, are published in special issues of social research. And the social research is orderable outside in the lobby. Either you can order the issue or you better still can subscribe. Now to today's conference and a word about our choice of the topic. We chose giving caring for the needs of strangers as our conference subject because we believe, I believe anyway, that the issues surrounding it are both eternally important and of particular importance now. At a time when the gap between the rich and the poor continues to widen, when most countries in the world are teetering on the edge of financial crises, leading to large increases in under and um, under and employment, and where and when I'm sorry, and when uh, catastrophic natural and man-made disasters seem to be on the rise, causing vast amounts of human suffering and uh, dislocation. So uh, convening a conference on giving seemed virtually mandatory. One only has to begin to understand the motivations between the Occupy movement and also because the school is here in Greenwich Village, we were also uh, uh, the victims of Sandy. We lost all power, school was closed for a week, and we too became strangers in need from uh, at least other people needed to help us, and of course they did. So it, this seems a very timely subject, but I, I don't mean this conference, and never meant this conference to be a lamentation about the a current extreme state of need, nor as an I uh, advertisement for the importance of giving, but rather as an avenue towards deepening our understanding of why we do and should give to others, what the roots of altruism are, how we can instill generosity in our young, what the religious and philosophic grounds for caring and given, giving to others are, and what the current balance between private philanthropy and government welfare programs m should be. Our base assumption is that understanding these issues is the most direct path to finding effective solutions to the many problems that confront us now. 
Of course, this conference, like all its predecessors, would not have been remotely possible without the generous support and, it, and advice of knowledgeable others. In particular, we are deeply grateful to the John Templeton Foundation, who, were the who was the major supporter of this conference, and the Rockefeller Archive Center, who were also generous supporters of the conference today. I would like to also just take a minute and thank uh, those of the members of the board of trustees, our board of trustees, who are in the audience today, who all of whom make the survival of the new school possible. So we are particularly grateful to them. them. Now, before I introduce tonight's main speaker, our keynote speaker, let me say a word about our distinguished moderator. Both our keynote speaker have, and the moderator have chosen to wait for their turn, and they're sitting in the audience, but they'll be on the stage soon. Our moderator is the distinguished Pulitzer Prize winning writer, Tracy Kidder. Tracy works as a freelance writer whose work has appeared, in, uh, among other places, in The New Yorker, The New York Times, and The Atlantic Monthly where he was for many years a contributing editor. He's taught writing at Smith and at Northwestern, but mainly he has spent the last 40 years writing wonderful and immensely readable books of narrative nonfiction. They are The Soul of, the, of a New Machine, House, Among School Children, Old Friends, Hometown, Mountains Beyond no Mountains, which is about Paul Farmer, the founder of Partners in Health, my Detachment and Strength in What Remains, which is about our keynote speaker tonight. Tracy Kidder's work has won many prizes, among them the Pulitzer Prize in General Nonfiction, the National Book Award, and I could go on. Uh, he has a book coming out, which he has uh, co-edited with Richard uh, Todd, uh, and it is called Good Prose, which will be published by Random House in January. And finally now, to our remarkable keynote speaker. Deo gratias, Nisan Kiza. Or to those of us who know him and love him, Deo, whose life and work is the very embodiment of the theme of this conference. I first learned about this extraordinary man when I read Tracy Kidder's book, because it got a marvelous review in the New York, Sunday New York Times uh, book review. And it actually, that book led me to consider giving up everything that I currently do and uh, to go and try and find Deo and help him. Obviously, I didn't do that, but I did get really lucky and I met him. And it was uh, by a series of events, but I got to meet Deo, and it was a wonderful thing that I did for me. Deo was born in rural uh, Burundi, where he attended grade school and began medical school before finally being forced to be, but not finally, but being forced to flee because of the Civil War. He arrived in the U.S. a complete stranger with virtually nothing and was tr truly rescued by the caring and kindness of strangers. With the help of others and with his own incredible courage and determination, he got to Columbia University where he completed his undergraduate work. Uh, and now with many, many, le I'm leaving stuff out, but now with many, many leaves of absence necessitated by doing what he's not now doing, which is running Village Health Works, which he founded, he is completing medical school at Columbia University. In 2006, Deo traveled back to Burundi to establish Village Health Works. Deo's passion rallied the southern Burundi community of Kigutu into action. With community donated land and an army of committed volunteers, the clinic opened in 2007. And it is growing and thriving. Deo's success in building an entirely community-driven health and development organization is unprecedented and makes Village Health Works unique among NGOs. He is devoting his life to caring for the needs of strangers. It is an honor to present him to you, Deo.
<laughs> Thank you so much, um, Arian. So sometimes when when there is an introduction and someone introduces you that way, you wonder whether there is anything else left to talk. So uh, I think Trace and I should just uh, come up here and you, you ask questions. But uh, <clears throat> it is a, truly a great honor uh, for me personally to be here uh, in front of you. And uh, of course, I wouldn't be here uh, without many people around here. I want to first thank the president of the new school for taking the time and uh, opening this wonderful house for everyone, those who call themselves strangers and those who call themselves inhabitants of this place. And <clears throat> although Arian just uh, told you everything I was going to tell you, uh, which is great, I love it that way. <laughs> I'm going to begin uh, by telling you my own story, not because it is worthier than anyone else's story, but because it is uh, the story I know best. And it is the story that I think illustrates so dramatically that the simple act of caring for a stranger and the consequences of that, and how more beautiful, more far-reaching, and more world-changing than you might ever imagine. Again, it's likely that I wouldn't be here before you, standing here, able to tell my story, if we're not for the help of people who would be considered strangers. And I use this word with respect and caution. Respect of the power of strangers, who I would agree, are the source of some of the most profound of human experiences, the beautiful and the ugly. Caution because I'm not convinced, actually, that we are ever strangers, even when, and perhaps especially, our otherness is used to justify brutality, evil strife, and other bloody horrors. Yes, I was a third-year medical student in Burundi in 1993 when Burundi's civil strife reached the hospital and it took the lives of patients and healthcare providers in that hospital. I spent the next six months on the run and hiding. I was running and I was afraid for my life. As I was running, <clears throat> I tried to process the kind of atrocity that I had seen, the mass killing not only by strangers, but also neighbors as well. How could we kill each other? Misery, poverty, hunger had dehumanized us. Neighbors and strangers alike. And yet, just as surely as strangers can take in horrifying ways, strangers can give purely and selflessly. During such difficult times, strangers shuttled me, fed me, and protect me from harm. It's fitting perhaps that in the moment when I was questioning all I understood about humanity. Strangers challenged my doubt. After six months, 
I sneaked back to Burundi from Rwanda and the father of a friend of mine helped me, got a ticket for me to New York, fees for a visa application and $200. I landed at JFK, unable to speak English, confused, my heart and mind broken. And I was carrying nothing but a luggage of tragedies and alone. A strangers again helped me at JFK and brought me to his squad in Harlem, which was kind of for him, but I felt unsafe. One day, <clears throat> I was exploring, I found a beautiful forest right in the middle of the city. I decided I would be better sleeping in the forest, and I did. Soon as I learned that it was Central Park, and I decided that I would be better, Caref be careful because parks in Burundi are not parks you have here in the city. I began to learn English from my fellow homeless people and on my own, some of the words I learned got me in trouble when other words I, were use, I was using were not the words I would like to repeat here. But I learned it them anyways. A fellow homeless <coughs> would ask me, for example, weed bro, weed bro. I would hear we, oui, the French word for yes. I kept saying we, oui, we. Oui. He kept asking, weed, weed. And it was not until recently, I have a friend here who is uh, <coughs> laughing at the story, uh, and he's the one who actually told me about a story about people smoking weed. It was not just recently that I learned that it was marijuana. I had never seen it, even today. I'm curious to know what it is but I'm not rushing into it. <laughs> Meanwhile, <clears throat> I found a, um, a job at delivering groceries for Christie's, Food Emporium, ANP, East and West Side of New York City. And I was paid $15 working from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. It is through that job that I met Sharon McKenna. Is she here? Can you stand up? And, <clears throat> and Sharon McKenna still works at St. Thomas More Church. Then Her interest of the language of Moliere and where I was coming from was a huge help for my survival. Sharon introduced me to an external couple, Nancy and Charlie Wolf, an artist and a reformed sociologist, as he likes to call himself. They are here with us tonight. Please stand up. Uh, <clears throat> they took me in, opened their doors and hearts for me. They became my second parents to me, and I'm still in a black hole, as they like to call it, with them. 
I was granted asylum status and with scholarship and the help from a new my new family. I entered Columbia University without the support of dear friends. I wouldn't be here and the immigration process would have been a nightmare. James O'Malley and Odelia Rockenstein, who are as well here, please stand up. <laughs> James is an immigration lawyer. <clears throat> I'm sorry, James, I'm going to tell this story. He had agreed to help even though he first thought I was from Bermuda. <laughs> and there was no genocide over there. It was not until when I wrote down on a piece of paper that he gave me the name of Burundi that he happened to learn that it was such a country called Burundi. And yes, I was born in Burundi, not Bermuda. People like to say <clears throat> that it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a special village, a compassionate village, to raise someone who is a grown up and someone who had just come from a tragedy. I wouldn't have survived without those people. And I'm glad that we are still together. They are my friends. At Columbia University, a long journey. I was informed by a classmate that I was a son of a king. Because if you were an African studying at Columbia with a, such a strange accent that God knows what else, you couldn't make it over there. Back then, I remember we were required to take a course 14th century English class and we were studying Geoffrey Chaucer's pilgrims and their clothing. One of the reading was the wife of Bath. In Chaucer's language, when I was still wrestling with the 20, 20th century English. I wouldn't have been able to survive it without the help of uh, another Columbia fellow student in anthropology who helped me with exchange for my helping him with the, his French. We even had so much fun over how reading my essays was giving him so much headache because he was unable to understand what I was writing that he was about to give up on me. When I told him that it couldn't be worse than what I was going through reading my and correcting his French, he smiled and said, welcome to Columbia University. And we made a pledge not to give up on each other, but to rise up and shine. I studied philosophy, searching for answers, but remained haunted by what I had seen and worried for my family in Burundi. I knew they had, for, they had been forced to flee, but I knew nothing about their fate. I thought constantly about the people, the suffering in my native land. Years later, <clears throat> I began dreaming of going back and easing that suffering. I could never remove the misery of Burundi from my head and put aside all I had lived through. This made me feel so lonely for so long I felt no one could understand me. I remained silent about it, partly because I had no words to describe this horror to anyone, partly because I thought it would have been unfair to expect anyone to understand what I was going through. But with time, I realized that I was wrong. Good people do not have to go through tragic situation before they can understand it. While taking courses at the Harvard School of Public Health, I met the now, now world famous Dr. Paul Farmer, co-founder of Partners in Health, 
and his colleague, Dr. Joe Mukherjee, who both offered me a job. During that time, I also met Dr. Ziwe, please stand up. We met on September 11, please stand up. <laughs> on September 11, and we were sharing stories about tragedies. And uh, from that time, we never left each other. He divides his time between Burundi and Columbia University in emergency medicine. Working closely with them in Boston and at one of the PIH hospitals in Rwanda, I felt that my childhood dream was coming back to life. I want to open a free health center in Burundi, a country where misery is the norm, a country that is today still off the map. Well, I, I know now you know where Burundi is, but uh, it's important to show you that it is actually part of East Africa. Uh, just a few years ago, <clears throat> I have a few eyewitnesses here. An immigration officer looked at my passport, which was still a Burundian passport before I became an American citizen, and, uh, and he said, he looked at it and he said, are you sure it's not from, it's not Burma? And I told him that it was Burundi when I left. Uh, that, that didn't help me that much. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, the population of Burundi. You can see some things happening here in 2005. The war started in uh, 1993 and ended officially in 2005. And then uh, uh, refugees, many who were neighboring countries, came back with so many children that within six years, the population almost doubled. When I was able to go back to visit my family, what I saw in Burundi simply devastated me more. The village of Kigutu, in an area near the borders of Kong and Tanzania, is especially hard hit by HIV AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria, post-traumatic stress disorders, gender-based violence and homelessness. What I saw moved me to put my medical studies on hold to found the nonprofit organization Village Health Works in this village of Kigutu. I want to bring free, dignified, community-supported medical services to the destitute sick. And I wanted to create a model that could be replicated throughout Burundi and far beyond its borders. In 2005, I began to engage the village in my plan. At first, I, I met a lot of skepticism and suspicion. I was a stranger after all. As I'm seeing the country, I saw a lot, and I went back, and I convinced the community that I was sincere. I said, well, you spent 13 years as the Hutu and Tutsis killing each other, but when you are sick, whether you're Hutu or Tutsi, you are taken to a hospital that becomes your prison, a place where you watch yourself die. Hutus and Tutsis die there together. These are not hospitals, these are where they are detained in hospitals because they can't pay. I asked the community members whether we could do it together. They were dancing and excited, Hutus and Tutsis together. And we can imagine why they were doing that. This is the hospital where anyone in that community among about half a million people who need surgery, this is where they have surgery. And this is a public hospital. This is one of many patients that I interviewed and I talked to. She was detained 
for this long. So, <clears throat> I think this idea helped them like the spark of their own optimism, which had been extinguished by the horrors they had lived through. This is how Village Earthworks was born. And it was born after too many years, really many years overdue. A year after, my fellow American friends raised some money. Quite some are still here. And we, be we began this construction. The men and the women of Kigutu built the road that links village, the village where they are and the main road heading to the capital city of Bujumura. This is our first meetings. And it's being happening on a precious land donated by these subsistence farmers, the only commodity they had. And they were tired of being thoroughly humiliated in hospitals because they had committed only one sin. They couldn't pay for substandard care. This is the excitement. These are the communities dancing. All these are volunteers. They have nothing else going on but the joy of hearing that there is a clinic going to be built. This is where they are damping these bricks and stones on this beautiful land, a beautiful country. Here, you couldn't stop them. My dear friend, Dr. Paul Farmer came to see us where we were and was overwhelmed by the excitement, the community engagement, and all of that in a country that had known nothing but misery, blood for so long. This is again the community making the road. We knew that we had no money, but we knew also that doing nothing was not going to make us happier. We had to do something knowing that we would fail a lot, but giving up was no longer an option. No electricity, no water. This is where we were sitting on the rocks and stones and bricks that we had collected, putting under this tree which was dying and now is called the hope tree. In this remote country, the corner of Burundi, a nation still recovering from a brutal 13 year old war, the destroyed infrastructure, the tears, the cries, no one around, we truly made miracle. But this would not have happened without the community, without those we call strangers in the United States of America. And when you visit, you will see the joy is not something you need to search for. The Village Health Works Medical Center was built from the joined hands and has delivered high quality health care, most of it at no cost, to more than 60,000 patients from when we started end of 2007. The solar power, the water tank, all of that, we needed it. And this is when we opened the clinic just hardly a year later. All these are patients. Dr. Ziwe, who is sitting here, was seeing all these patients using daylight. There was no one, no electricity, and that was hard. But it could never have been harder than being in this kind of situation. And seeing that is what kept him and everyone moving forward, not giving up. So keep that in mind. The staff, we have now about 150 people. They have trained 100 plus community health workers. 
to deliver medicines for those who are HIV positive, who have TB, and we see them in their homes, they don't give up. This is again Ziwe, who is right here. When you are lucky to not pouring rain, uses the sunlight, but Americans and our friends from other places, we didn't let him down, were able to raise money for solar system. What do we do? What kind of patients? This Frederick was retrieved from his home when he was abandoned by his family, including his wife and children, because they worried that whatever was killing him was going to affect everyone. We took him to Village Health Works, and that is him. He works with us. The community's moved. is really on its own, moving faster than I had imagined. It's truly a community effort. And from the start, we established these communities. They still advise and concert on clinic projects Men and women overcame unspeakable tragedies and somewhat, somehow, cultivated trust. Those are former enemies who spent 13 years hunting each other with machetes. So we're not really just building clinic, but building peace. We remembered how to rely on one another, bound by mutual responsibility. This reliance on the other extends far beyond clinical work. It is this reliance that propels the vision of Village Health Works, donations of time and money and skills of people who are strangers to the people of Burundi, but feel tied to their well-being. Doctors from around the world, they join, they see patients, and this is what they do when they come back. This is what they see, and this is what happens after they come back. We deal with education because education is important, but we have to be healthy to be able to study. We have to be healthy to be able to function. Why this misery, and why Burundi? Here's what they say. We often feel forgotten by the world and even unloved. My Navy community felt as if their great tragedies were invisible, but in Kigutu and through Village Health Works, the care of strangers far away makes them feel human again. The people of small rural village feel welcomed into the world community. And that, that restores their self-respect, dignity, and their hope for a better life and lasting peace. And the people who are caring for strangers deepen their own self-respect and add to their store of hope. And there is a larger issue, I think. Someone might ask, that isn't it enough to give to people you know, to care for people in need who are part of your family or your neighborhood? That's good too. But I believe with all my heart that giving to strangers also creates a balance in the world. A balance to human beings long, ugly story of taking from strangers probably beginning when one protohominate bopped another with a bone and took his delicious saber tooth, tiger imperial. Sadly, the history of taking from strangers may have reached its height in the imperial plunder of the African continent. That wherever you are in the world, giving to strangers gets the balance right again. And from a place of balance, 
anything becomes possible. It's a transformative foundation. I can tell you so many stories showing how Village Health Works is transforming lives from bottom up. But I would like to conclude with one of the stories that means the most to me. Maybe because it shows so clearly the chain of giving in action. I will never forget one woman who came to help build the, the road heading to our clinic, bringing her sick child. She said to me, instead of staying at home watching my baby die, I'd rather come here because at least then my contribution can save someone as a child. Her child was eventually treated for malaria. The medication we gave me, she said, helped my child. And this work is also more precious than we can ever think. I asked her what it was. She said, ending the crisis. The crisis, I asked. And yes, the crisis can end. People have been talking and working together, and this is ending the crisis in Burundi. Crisis is the word, <coughs> the word Burundians use instead of genocide. At Village Health Works, we are not just building this clinic. We are not into politics. We talk to people, former enemies. They are together. They learn how to care for one, for one, one another, and it's so profound. These difference, the otherness, are now working toward the same goal and seeing the result of shared efforts. In turn, those efforts are multiplied by the decision of strangers to care, to acknowledge our interdependence and by their actions challenge their, the very construct of the other. Education is important. For what? People die from malnutrition, not because they are lazy or they don't know how to grow food, but because no one has taught them what kind of food they need to grow. And this is what we are dealing with, growing the right food so that malnutrition can be eradicated. And this is the outcome of that. The patients we treated for free are now on their own. They can be happy, be proud, and do good, and show that they too are capable of showing what is possible. But we have a long way to go. This is Dr. Melino, who is the medical director. You can see his smile. But how many times is he smiling? Seeing this woman who is pregnant, the baby inside is happy, but often the babies are dead inside their mom's womb. And they die because we don't have enough infrastructure. And that's why we talk to friends, some of them who are here, Louis Braveman, a wonderful architect who's been designing our homes, our clinic, and this is what we are planning to do. And this is the, our campus. And none of this will be happening without each one of us. I want to end here. Tracy is looking at me. And I'm sure it's traveled a lot. I want to thank you so much for all your time. And, and I hope we can continue this conversation as a community, the community that is building life far away from where we are, a community that is not a stranger, but community to community. Thank you very much. I'm Tracy Kidder. I'm going uh, to remind Dale of a little uh, thing that happened between us. In, in, in 2006, we were in Kigali, the capital of Rwanda, <coughs> about to go to Burundi the next morning. 
And we were drinking um, alcoholic beverages, I believe. There was no marijuana. <laughs> there was no marijuana. By, by the way, smoking, I guess. Is it smoking or drinking? And I, I, I happened to record our conversation, so here are some excerpts from it. And this is you speaking, Dale. You said, so my pipe dreams are these. You know, if the Kugutu project is successful, we can expand around and people will see, oh, it works, it's good. And hopefully the whole country will begin to understand without bringing a hammer. Because once you bring a hammer, people will bring something too, a shield with another hammer to break your legs. But I'm not dangerous to these people. I'm a friend. I have no harmful weapon or anything. I just want them to be happy and healthy. The only cure for this whole tragedy would be to treat people, keep them healthy, give them a strong education, get them educated, and show them the value of work, and that would erase all this. Not the history, but it would create a new world which is the same world, make it peaceful and a wonderful paradise. I know, you've, you said sort of at the end of this, I have these unrealistic beliefs and thoughts and that the world can be peaceful, can be healthy, you know, people can be humane, but is it feasible? And I said, in my usual um, half-assed way, well, you won't know unless you try. <laughs> That's right. So uh, what I want to know is where do your pipe dreams stand now? Uh, how, how far along the road do you think you are to getting there? Or put this another way, um, what's your vision of the future for what is now a very successful, but still rather small project. Well, th thank you very much, Tracy. Um, you know, when, when I was uh, telling you all this, I thought I was talking to myself. They didn't know that you were taking note, but, uh, uh, <clears throat> but I just want you to know that this is true, what he told you. Uh, <clears throat> where we are, um, the vision of Village Health Works is, uh, is uh, frankly bigger than uh, we expose it. And there are reasons for that. Um, <clears throat> it's not easy to first talk even about Burundi. And uh, it is definitely more difficult for me knowing what the situation is and knowing what so little in this country can actually do in Burundi. And so it's really being between world. You go to a place that has less than nothing there, and then you fly back. You know, I, it took me time to, to, to buy a um, subway metro card because of the value of that, how much we do in Burundi. And it, become very, it becomes very difficult for me to talk about the vision. But now that you ask me, I will tell you. It's not just the village of Kigutu. It's not just Kigutu that has been suffering. Kigutu, the people in Kigutu have suffered a lot equally, like everyone else, maybe in some places even worse. But we had to start somewhere. And the goal is to show the world, starting from the people of Burundi, that actually were the, a place that used to be called hell on earth, everyone is running away from it, is a, can be a place like any other place. Can be not just a place like other places, but a place where people can come and see what is possible when good people come together to do good. That is the vision of Village Health Works. It is also a vision that is not just going to, limit, to be limited in Burundi. It is a vision that is going to show African governments, Burundians, and Africans that neglecting the community, those at the bottom, is a miserable failure of imagination. They are two human beings who are proud of participating, of being told, you too can do it, Joan. So it is really a vision that is going to be replicated, and I hope so, beyond Burundi, but we are still 
some people say small. We are not small, we are young. I think there are difference, you know, some difference between the two. Uh, our catchment area has 200,000 people. We see people coming from different uh, parts of the country, even though the government of Burundi told us that this is where you need to focus. So we are hoping that the rest of Burundi is seeing what is happening. First, former enemies working together, becoming friends, building their own medical center, working together, and just do that, or even better, because if you don't do better, there is no progress at all. Uh, so that's where we are, but we have a long way to go, and we have to make more friends and uh, keep our friends, um, understand that it's not about Dale, it's not about anyone else, it's about all of us who care about human life, dignity, and uh, this is what makes us all human. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Um, and, but how about if I ask you a question? Okay, it's fine, fine with me. Yeah. Well, well uh, <clears throat> I know we were together in Burundi. Um, you, I don't think that <clears throat> you even knew Burundi before we met. That's true. <laughs> I did not know there was a place and, called uh, Burundi. And I'm, uh, I'm curious to know, you have been involved very much so after our trip together back in 2006. And I think actually that personally helped me more than anything else because uh, before you went to Burundi, I remember, uh, I don't think that I was able to communicate enough uh, um, about what was going on. It was not until when we arrived there, uh, if I remember that you really saw the misery, what I was talking about. Uh, but again, so many people have been there, but they didn't remain involved. They didn't stay with us. What 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 makes you special, well, different from? I'm not special. Us? Um, it's partly your fault. Um, Sorry. But uh, <laughs> I remember I remember visiting Kagutu, uh, the village where the clinic was going to be built with you in 2006, and I remember. Uh, we went with a bunch of your American friends, uh, doctors to be, and um, and um, all Americans. And a lot of the village, hundreds of people turned out to, to greet us. If, do you remember? And they were um, there were chants of I remember the chants of Amohoro, which of course in Kurundi means peace. Um, and then uh, there were a lot of speeches, uh, speech from the. Uh, from Dale, from you, for which the villagers cheered, uh, and then speeches from the town's elders, which you translated for us, and then speeches from your American friends, which you translated into Gurundi. And near the end of all this, you asked me if I wanted to say something, and um, I did, of course, I always do, uh, alas. Uh, uh, when many people, I think I said, when many people in your village are sick, it's a terrible thing to be told that it will take a long time to provide them with a clinic, but it will take time, I said. And, uh, and then I, uh, I looked out, I, I remember seeing their faces, which looked both skeptical and hopeful, and I remember feeling inspired and saying, but I promise you uh, that we'll do everything we can to get this clinic built. And, and afterward, as you were translating my words in Karundi, I thought they sounded pretty good. And then um, I thought the equivalent of, oh dear, uh, had it really been necessary to use the word promise. So, um, you know, promise is a promise. So I, I, I gave Village Health Works some money, and I found a couple of other Americans uh, who were willing to give some to. It wasn't a huge sum of money. It wasn't a hard thing for any of us to do. Um, but, it, but it wasn't, you know, it helped to appease one's conscience a little bit. Um, and a more, much more important, obviously, to help get construction started, right? Yeah. Um, the fact is that getting something w w done in a place like Burundi doesn't cost very much. It costs a lot in terms of effort and pain and so on, but not a lot in the way of money. And I do think uh, that it's always important as an American to remember that we still have, uh, even when we're in recession, uh, have a lot of power 
to improve the lives of people in, in places like Burundi. The, the really important thing to me is to invest wisely um, in, in organizations that, uh, that are not self-serving, as too, far too many NGOs are, uh, but in organizations like Village Health Works, Partners in Health, and so on. Um, and I, I, I know I'm, I'm yakking on here, but I did prepare some thoughts. I, I, I remember that guy who came to see the clinic in Kaguta once it was built, and he wasn't sick. This wasn't actually all that uncommon, but you said to him, uh, why'd you come? And he said, to see America. That's right. So, which is pretty unusual uh, in this era. And, and um, you know, I, I remember Obama, President Obama talking about, in, in Ghana, this is now some time ago, you know, dreaming of a, of a new era of American and African cooperation, uh, one that would be guided by mutual responsibility. And I think that the, part of my continuing interest is just that it does seem to me that Village Health Works represents um, a, a model of American and African co uh, cooperation and, and perhaps the beginning or the potential beginning of an antidote to um, the kind of awful war that Burundi uh, un underwent, which as I see it was, you know, a st a, which took a small historical difference between two groups of people and magnified it for the advantage of a few into something that was truly lethal. So, you know, it seemed to me, it seems to me, it still seems to me that, that Village Health Works, what you've uh, worked to do with all your friends is uh, an instrument of peace. And also, I, I, you know, just speaking personally, I feel like when you witness scenes like People, I remember the guy we saw at one of the hospitals who hadn't been able to pay his bills, so he was sitting outside of the hospital's nursery begging for food because he'd been detained there. He couldn't leave. He was basically imprisoned. When you see scenes like that or, or people dying of diseases that, that really would be easy for us to treat here, um, I think you feel, um, most of us do, I, I certainly do, I know you do, uh, that you've incurred some sort of responsibility for at least trying to do something about it. Um, and then there's the final thing that, that I do feel pretty strongly, and one reason why I want to continue to be involved as long, until I get thrown out, uh, is, is the fact that when I... W you're not going to throw me out. Don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you say that now. <laughs> but... but when I wake up in the morning, I still read the newspapers. You know, I don't, I don't even read them online. But it's not always a very encouraging thing to do. And, you know, sometimes it seems like the world is, often actually, it seems like the world is ruled by violence and chaos. And it is extremely important somehow, for, to me, to know that there are counterforces out there. And that some of those counterforces are actually competent and in, indeed effective. And I'm not for a minute imagining I don't think I could ever summon the data to suggest that these counterforces are going to win, but just the fact that they are there seems tremendously important to me. And I, I think, Dale, we're, since I'm supposed to be the moderator, I think we're supposed to let others ask questions, which we'd be glad Thank to. Thank you very Dale much. Dale would be glad to answer <laughs> if, if you have any. Oh, and there are microphones here if you are bold enough to approach them. Oh dear. Oh yes, great. <laughs> no such thing as a stupid question, just a stupid answer. I, I wonder if you would speak a bit about the consciousness of your collaboration. For example, when you were in the airport and you were going back to Burundi, and you're, there's an awareness, you're writing a book, um, and he's building a nonprofit, and you're engaged in this kind of collaborative philanthropy. Did you talk about that? It wasn't quite like that at all. No. Really, it wasn't like that at all. I, uh, in this case, I'm just a writer. I didn't set out to do a good deed. I wanted to tell a good story. I happened to cross one. Somewhere along the line, though, I think it was when I got there that I, you know, and that I heard Dale, he had actually told me before we got there that he had this, had had this childhood dream and that he had these plans. And I remember talking to one of the young medical students who was with, a, with us, um, when we went up to Kigutu, uh, I remember her saying, is this possible, is this feasible? And she said, oh, sure. You know, she'd been working for Partners in Health, so she knew that it was. So I, I resolved right then that I would get involved. Although 
And I knew that some of my uh, colleagues in, in journalism wouldn't approve. And uh, I thought about that for a little while, maybe two or three minutes. And then I thought of how, how often I'd come to disapprove of them. And I thought, I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> but but, but I, I do want to say, I mean, it is true that I that I'm a writer, first of all, a storyteller, and, and I feel like my first allegiance is to the people I'm telling, a, t telling the story to. However, I, d I don't see any, necess any necessary inconsistency in that. I, I, don't, I'll just, I don't mean it in any um, no, no, critical I, I, way. It's just I, that. I just uh, wanted to make it clear that I didn't set out to, to, to try to help Village Health Works come into existence. But, and I wonder if you would talk a little bit about, uh, about being the subject of a book and what that must be like and the relationship you, you have. It was <laughs> hell on earth. <laughs> <laughs> Fair that's enough. That's you, you, you got it. But let me come back to what you just said. <clears throat> well, uh, it's actually, uh, uh, it goes back to what uh, um, I was trying to say. You know, if you come from a place that, you know, I'm from here too, but where I was born and I grew up, and all you see it is what is around you. You know, um, shoes, wearing shoes, that was not something that I had ever imagined. Uh, in fact, when I got shoes for the first time, I carried them instead of wearing them. Uh, and so that is normal, but it's not normal here. And you have uh, someone who is writing about, who is curious about where I was coming from. So I'm here uh, carrying everything that is abnormal here when it is normal where I am from. What uh, troubled me a lot uh, was not the first time, actually, when Trace was asking me questions, I simply had no words to describe any of this stuff. And then you end up having headaches all the time, wondering, what does he want from me to say? But even going back before, when I was uh, in college at Columbia University, I actually apologized to some faculty members that I actually destroyed quite a few books about Burundi in the library, not tearing papers about underlining and writing what people who write about, about a country that is so tiny, about the Hutus and Tutsis, how different they are as if you are talking people from different planets. And ignoring that, these are human beings created by God who speak one language, same culture, and are just divided and dehumanized by misery. And it's exactly the consequence of that human behavior, the misery we see, that attract us all. We don't go back and look at the root causes of tragedies. So, I'm always interested in the root causes as opposed to the consequences. And knowing what I went through myself, and if you think that I went through a lot, I am alive, I'm sitting here. How many people are not here who tried even harder than I did, who were so bright and they didn't make it? Countless, how many stories. Each one here has a story. It's a whole library that we really don't know. And that is the beauty I always find in a conversation that is real. That going back, I, I actually hated him so much before he went to Burundi. I mean, he, he chewed me like a chewing gum <laughs> until, you know, we went back and, and I really got so much relief when he saw what I was talking about. That, by the way, was not just Tracy, but it was also Paul Farmer, who, you know, we used to work together, going to hit different places, and they would say, you know, what, you know, help me, you know, help me keep talking about this, you know, these miseries. And they would say, you, th you think this is bad? I never like to compare misery, you can never compare misery. Pain is pain. 
But what I saw in Haiti in different places in these Haitians, that was a norm to me. Why should I have gone out to Christ? This person is dying when it was part of my life. It was normal. So you really, but of course he knew what he was doing. He needed friends. And this is how isolating this kind of work we do is. It, it's, it's very hard. When you talk, for example, build a staff residence for the, 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 our friends who are in Burundi. We have this tiny, and the Tracy helped, that was a help. That was for 15 people, and it ended, ended up housing 50 people, parked like sardines. So when we talk about building another one, it becomes so expensive, but how expensive is that when you talk to people who really understand what the tragedy is? The tragedy is that we actually talk to people who actually don't think about this a lot. When we see all these patients in the hands of doctors and nurses, as we speak, you know, those who are lucky, they get out, you know, smiling when they came to us in tears, even those who are not lucky, just because of the care, the dignity, the respect we give them, knowing that there's a chance we are never going to be able to send this patient back home alive. They still thank you. And that is something that you don't see in so many places. And when you talk to all these uh, physicians and nurses, Imagine being in, in, in a clinic where well, four out of six pregnant women have babies that are dead. How, how, and then you talk about brain drain. It's overwhelming, it's demoralizing. So if you understand that nothing is expensive at all, and if you see the consequence, the result of that, when you build an infrastructure, you are going to train local people. They are not going to run away, believe me. They love their native land more than anyone else. But it's what is going on that makes us run away from a tragedy. And this is, uh, you got me started. So, so basically, no, basically you were hoping that I would learn some of that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you did. <laughs> well, some, perhaps. Please. Well, thank you very much for a very inspiring um, talk. And um, I wonder if you could explain a little bit more about what you think, or the sort of, it seems like a rather a silly question, sort of elements of your success. Now, this is not the only initiative that tries to build clinics in rural areas in Burundi or in Africa, elsewhere. It's not the only project that tries to mobilize communities to, to do things of this kind. Um, but what is remarkable about it, it, it seems to have succeeded enormously well. And from, I mean, I'm a development economist. I work in, uh, in development. So, um, so looking at it in that way of having looked at such projects around the world, um, what is astonishing about this particular experience is it seems to, to work, and in fact many such projects actually don't work, they collapse after a couple of years. What is so special about it is that it is truly built on community self-help self, self and mobilization. But that often is not enough. So maybe you can reflect a little bit more on telling us you know, what are the elements of why this is such a successful project when so many others actually tried to do the same and failed? I, I can answer, I, I mean, I can try to answer a little bit and then Dale can answer more, I think. I, I think, the, first of all, the community involvement is absolutely genuine. And also, it would be wrong to say that the Village Health Works hasn't had problems. I mean, it's, in some ways, you could think of it one problem from beginning till now, right? But it has had uh, quite remarkable success. I think that's partly, I, I think Dale would say this, from my perspective, I think it's partly the, uh, uh, the help that Dale got from Partners in Health, which after all had a very large project just across the border in Rwanda, really not far away, um, training for nurses, but also the, you know, 
certain kinds of inspiration, um, a model of, of, of how one might use community health workers effectively. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, a pretty generous support that Deo had managed to drum up here in the United States, that was important. And I think also his continuing participation. The fact that Deo is Burundian makes an enormous difference and that he is willing and was willing to go to the mat with the various ministers who wanted bribes from him and, and, and found a way not to give him those bribes, to get what he wanted and not get killed, I think it's really quite remarkable. <laughs> but I think those things were, those are some of the elements, I think, involved. <clears throat> well, <laughs> thank you, Tracy. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's true. Um, <clears throat> But, uh, you know, when you come up with something, first of all, if it's about yourself, expect a tragic result. When it is about including everyone else, including those who are suffering the most, then you will see the result you want but it is still not easy. Uh, you, you, you have to be determined to not give up. I can tell you that there were so many days when each day I would ask myself, what was I thinking? But that was actually happening because I was getting hard time from those who were signing papers and different you know, things to allow um, donations and tools to come in and all that, well, it's because they are not hungry. If you talk to someone who is hungry about food, do you actually expect some resistance? If you talk to someone who is dying about medicine, do you actually expect that person to tell you, no, I don't want it? If you hear that, that person is not hungry and that person is not sick. Deal with those who need your help the most. And Burundi, where we are, is a country that is off the map. Neglected, abandoned, needs friends. These are people who do not take high for granted. They will bless you. They will see another life just because of that. That's where we are. Yeah, I, I think that, I, there's another question. So, thank you so much for your amazing contribution and to the gift you give to us, and I quote you <laughs> again, you said it would have been unfair to expect anyone to understand what I went through. And what question occurs to me is when you finally raised the roof, as we say, and were start able to start treating the people in the village, how did you address the tales that they felt would completely unfair to, to tell. Their, their trauma, their living with disease and wounds from a war over years and years. And, and to what level is that addressed and, and how, how, how does that work in, in, in your world view of this project? Well, that, that's, that's a very complicated question. Oh. Uh, I will try to, to, to answer it. <clears throat> well, so we, we are in a country that uh, suffered a lot. Um, but uh, um, again, as I said, we, there are two things that, in my opinion and in my experience, I have noticed in the human nature. And one is um, uh, treating the consequences as a culture, cultural behavior. Uh, and again, I'm going back to what desperate people do. They do desperate things. And uh, um, it was important for us, and that was not that hard to not talk about the consequences, but to figure out how do we become human beings again? Mm -hmm. And by asking ourselves that question, 
uh, meant that we needed to go back and see what was missing. And as a result of that, when we opened the clinic, for example, you would see, for example, a woman who is showing up, I have headaches. Everyone is coming with headaches. But what is really causing these headaches? So we actually started new programs based on medical histories that we're gathering from patients, figuring out what the needs, without talking about, well, you need a psychiatrist because your mental status is not quite right, but what is causing that really? Uh, I give you an example. There is this woman who spent, I don't remember how many years in Tanzania, and she came back uh, with uh, uh, three children, and four of them died in Tanzania. Her husband died. When she came back, she had nothing left. The land was taken by the brothers of her husband who died. So she's not, she can't even go back to where she was born. She's a woman, and a woman doesn't own a land. And where she came back, where her husband was, her husband is no longer there. So she spent, in order to feed her children, the only strategies were to, I'm going to find land somewhere and grow food for my children. And he, she did. The man who gave her that land told her, you, you, you grow food here and I take 50% and you take 50%. That was not hard. It turned out that she'd become her con his concubine. And that was extremely devastating. She couldn't keep up. So she came to our clinic, headaches after headaches. So she's talking in tears and says, how, is he, how, is, how are you, how are your children? So you, you collect all that and uh, finally we found a land through our co-ops, cooperative societies. Now we have uh, agricultural co-ops and all that. She's one of the women dancing over here. So that's how you really deal with that whole issue. So you really have to understand how do you approach this situation. Now, there are so many NGOs, someone was talking about this. If you have a PhD or an MD, God knows in the what, and you think that the best place for you to make a difference is a place that is far away from where you are, don't lecture people about what to do. Sit down, eat what they are eating. If they are hungry, feel it and it take time. Then they get to know you, you get to get to know them, and then you will have a, a frank conversation. So a, a, all that really is not just about experience, it, it's about conversation, listening, and feeling the pain of the others. That's what I think is, it takes. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is James. Um, I thank you, uh, Mr. Kida and Deo. Um, your story just encourages me as a brother. I'm Ugandan, um, and uh, I, my story is no different than yours. I lost my entire family of seven in Western Uganda. So I am blessed to be here. Uh, my American mother, actually, who, you know, the family that gave everything for me to come here and get my education like you did, picked your book somewhere in, in when she was out in the store and she says, you must read this book, James, and I've been encouraged. I have to tell you for the work that you're doing, but also knowing that I still have that responsibility to my community. Um, I guess the question that I would ask would be the idea that what I, I struggle with when I go back to my village uh, in rural Uganda, in western Uganda, between Mbarara and Masaka, I'm sure you know, is that I am no longer seen as part of that community, I'm seen like as I'm a foreigner. Um, like he mentioned the idea that you're gonna, you, they're asking you for bribes. And I just want to ask how did you integrate your knowledge into the community and work with the community and assure them, that, or reach that assurance that you are still part of them and you're gonna work with them. And then the other one that I struggle with a lot is how my, my premises with the young generation of Africa 
And how do we, from our stories that are so unique, there are many smarter guys, there are many smarter young men that would have made it or women, but they didn't. And so I guess is how do you let them know that they can do it, that they don't have to travel to America? I, I struggle with that. And so if, have you ever thought about that and if you have any ideas? Because to me, what actually propels me to return and I'm going back next year after my fellowship um, is to say to them that you can do it. Like you don't have to travel to America. Yes, I may have lost my family. You may have lost yours, but you can do it where you are. And how you do that, I, I, I would love your wisdom and Mr. Kidders as well. <clears throat> well, thank you very much uh, for your questions. Uh, but right away I can tell you that uh, these are issues that I'm still struggling with. Um, <clears throat> I think I mentioned that it is not easy to be between worlds. Um, I am often a stranger in my own native village, and I'm a stranger here. Uh, and, um, and, 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 and that's hard. And it's even harder when you are talking about the pain of the others, not about even your pain. Because we are so accustomed to thinking, isn't that for you when it's not? So that's kind of unusual. But uh, just to cut along, you know, just maybe talk to your heart and make friends. And there are many kinds of friends. Um, be frank, be honest with each other. And I know, um, I don't know what it is in Kampara, for example. I take my American friends to where I was born and where I grew up. It's, a, it's a hard. Um, Ziwahi is my eyewitness. There is a friend who screamed and yelled, where is the coffee? Uh, but we had none of, uh, actually, we grow coffee in Burundi, but we don't drink it. Um, uh, if you want a really good coffee grown in Burundi, you go to France or Belgium. Uh, so, so, or you go to Kampara. So, Make sure that you don't get stuck in Kampala. Uh, for example, Burundi is a Francophone country. How many people speak French in Burundi? 3% uh, of the population, even like a broken French. What about Kirundi, which is spoken by 97% of the population? So I think there is this whole mentality that I truly believe is a colonial legacy that was uh, created in the minds of so many people the civilized and uncivilized, the misery that dehumanizes people again. And when you are lucky to get an education, you run away, you go to the capital city, back to where your parents are. It's too poor for you to go to, and we expect them to go to Kampara to visit you or Bujumbura to visit you. And I know that personally. I know even within my own family. Uh, so if you go back, I would be surprised that you neighbors in the villages, those who were with you in a primary school but didn't make it through, will salute you with so much respect. But if you stay in Kampala where you don't speak um, Luganda, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, right, okay. Uh, and you know, you are going to be lost within your own home country. And even your friends from right here, when they go to Kampala, you really have no much to teach them. Take them where the people are. And then they will be more comfortable and they will get to know you, you get to know them. I think that is what um, happens. But you will have a lot of struggles because you are coming from the United States of America with the history that all Americans are wealthy, are rich, and the Western world and all that. So it's that mentality that you need to take back home and eradicate, uproot, and do the work, get the community engaged from bottom up. In Burundi, we had a hard time get, dealing with the government. It took a year, and Tracy knows that, uh, the board of directors, to actually sign the documents to allow us to get donations to our clinic. And it was not until a few years ago when vice presidents and the president of the country 
decided to come to see what is going on in that village. And actually, when the people call it America, we're going to see America, they themselves said, we're going to see America. And they had no idea. So we are actually teaching those other, you know, high up to see what is possible. So if you do that, it's not going to be easy, that's for sure. But giving up is not an option. But keep up, and when we keep up, you will get more friends, and we get there. And this is the message you need to tell your African fellows. Africa is not cursed. The curse lies in here, how we view ourselves, and the curse lies in this belief that it was the colonial legacy. I, I'm sure you didn't see it. I didn't see it. What makes me feel it's the Belgians when I didn't see them? Forget about it. It's a waste of time. And that is a tragedy in human nature. We waste most of our time talking about how impossible a thing is instead of actually getting up and fixing problems. And the problems sometimes should be seen as opportunities as a sister of a friend who is here said to me the other night. That is what makes you alive. You are a human being. I am capable of doing this. I'm going to fix it with everyone else. And if you do it alone, it's for yourself. It's not for the community. And you will be miserable. So it's just that you need to do. And uh, I hope we can, we can keep in touch. Yes. Because we are neighbors. We are not actually Ugandans and Burundians. We are East Africans. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Same you. country. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I think we've run out of time. Um, sorry to say, uh, we have run out of time, Marion. Thank you all very much for coming, and thanks to Dale, especially. Thank you. <laughs>